good morning, or good, af good afternoon. Um, firstly, my name's John Dean. I'm the Chief Commercial Officer at Punter South or Health and Protection, and we've got 25 minutes or so to talk about wellbeing dashboards. Um, over the last year, two years particularly, more and more companies have been approaching us and working with us saying, well, what should the dashboard look like for execs? What should it look like? How can we build it? What, how do we make it relevant, etc." So what we're going to do, I'm just going to do a five minute introduction about sort of the sort of things you need to do at a CEO level. And then Anna is going to come and talk to you. Anna's our, one of our actuaries, but also specialised in building wellbeing dashboards. And she's going to share with you some experiences of other company dashboards. So we think probably just sharing with you what others might be doing is probably as relevant as anything. OK, so that's what we're doing. So first and foremost, um, There is so much out there that you could do. You could do. You could do anything. Mental health, digital apps, nutrition, exercise. There's so much you can do. But what's going to be relevant for your organisation? What's going to really engage your executive? What does your dashboard need to be? It needs to be relevant to your management. It needs to be relevant to your stakeholders. It needs to be relevant to your shareholders. And it needs to be something you can be proud of and build on. Okay? So, you've got to start somewhere. And even if it starts off as a pretty boring and pretty basic dashboard, you need to start somewhere and then build from here. Okay? So what we're expecting is a CEO and leadership team that in plain English knows what this dashboard looks like. So there's lots of very clever people here today using lots of big words. But this practice, this dashboard needs to be plain English that the CEO, the CFO, but the shareholder, the investor gets it, knows why you're doing it, and knows how you're measuring. So that's the first thing. So there needs to be something where you can say, right, this is my dashboard, this is what we're measuring. Anna's going to talk about measurements, but some of you could have this brilliant dashboard, but you just can't build it because you haven't got all the relevant data at this stage. So build a dashboard that you can build. You may want to improve it, but build something that you can measure and can start with. Then get your execs engaged with it and say, yeah, we're going to measure against that dashboard and we're going to update it. And most firms would update their, their well-being dashboard probably quarterly these days, quarterly, maximum half yearly. Okay? But it's got to be simple, easy to use, and it needs to come with easy data feeds that you can pull from your organization so it's relevant. So that's what we do and how we work on dashboards. We think the, the leading well-being managers in companies and leading corporates are going to increasingly invest in building even more valuable and very much more sophisticated well-being dashboards. But start simple and build from there. So I'm now going to pass over to Anna. We recruited Anna and her team a few years ago now to really help with data analytics. Because well-being consultants are either fit into the camp of being brokers, consultants and brokers, or they sell products, well-being products. So what we decided to do was bring in an analytical team. So all they do is the analysis of getting all your data around and then pulling it into this dashboard. So I'm going to pass over to Anna, who will show you a lot more about what she does. Thank you. So yeah, today I'm just going to cover um, some of the uh, insight that's come out of the REBA survey this year, and then a bit about how to approach building your dashboard, and it's certainly not one size fits all. And then hopefully, for those of you who do like data, bring it to life a bit with a few examples of what we've been doing with different clients. So um, for those of you who filled in the survey this year, you will have seen that we've added some more questions around measuring the effectiveness of your strategy. And this is because, as John says, we're getting increasing demand for dashboards, feed into business cases, um, uh, reporting to the board level, um, and also just trying to get that budget signed off for wellbeing. So a lot more clients are coming to us and looking for a bit more robustness around what they're doing. Um, in terms of what people are currently doing at the moment, in terms of measuring effectiveness, um, the bulk are around kind of the employee engagement rates, employee feedback, um, and some of the harder measures around sort of the impact on health, um, 
the impact on insurance, and also ROI, um, there's less people measuring them. And ROI, as we all know, is the kind of that golden nugget. Um, I don't think there's one amazing formula that's going to give that to you. And you do have to approach it with caution and put it in context. So we advocate looking at a much broader set of measures, and I'll go into that in a minute. And then around a quarter of people, a quarter of companies who have put wellbeing strategies in place don't measure anything at all at the moment. And what they're saying are the um, barriers to that are um, limited data, both internally and externally, so with your third-party providers of wellbeing services. And I would say if you're looking to get providers in place, use this as part of your tender exercise. Know what you want to measure and have that conversation with them up front. What data are they going to be providing and in what format? Um, a lot of providers are now um, looking at this space a lot more, so it, it is improving. Um, and lack of data analytics experience. So where do you start? So like everything, um, preparation is key to this. And just putting a bit of effort into your data plan and data strategy will give you the best results out of this. So defining your scope. So if you have got a wellbeing program or a wellbeing strategy in place, then it should give you the scope of what you're looking at. And that scope, if you're looking at wellbeing or health as a whole, could go above and beyond your part of the business. So you might need to collaborate with other areas um, to get them involved. The so what, which I'll come on into in a minute. So this is not about drawing pretty diagrams. It is about doing actionable insight and being able to drive changes from there. And as John said, you can start quite basic, so don't get too worried about it. Just make a start and then evolve it as we go along. Um, the wellbeing journey in terms of the corporate wellbeing space is changing all the time, and we don't know what will be most significant now in a few years' time, so we just have to get on that journey. Look at your existing data sources and find out you know, if there's gaps, and also then set a data strategy, and I'll talk to that in a bit. Validate, so the quality of the data is obviously key, and then interpret your data. And what we do a lot around is visualizing that data. So who's your audience? Um, so if you were building a reporting pack that actually you're giving to your HR business managers to uh, go out and do on the ground action, but you also want to report to board, how do you build a really effective framework for that data strategy so you're not doing loads of different analyses, you're building one, one piece. Okay, so the so what, so defining your purpose. So again, looking at is this a business case, is this regular monitoring? So quite a few of our clients are now coming wanting quarterly dashboards that pull together all of their well-being initiatives in one place so they can clearly see that they're making an impact. Um, but also board reporting, which will be a slightly different focus. And really important, are the initiatives that you're putting in place working? So where you're spending your wellbeing money, is that working? And also, do you have a, an idea of what your health and wellbeing spend is in total? Um, because it could be in different pockets. As I said, developing your data strategy. So look at what data you do have. There's bound to be gaps because you haven't driven that data collection based on what you need it for now. So you may be sitting on a gold mine, but the chances are you probably aren't. And there'll be things in there that are hard to analyze because they're free text. Um, but there's also others, other things that you can do to improve straight away, which might be looking at the data capture processes. So who the users are that are filling it in and just reconfirming what you want them to do. And is that user journey easy? And as I said, talking to third parties. But just start simple and keep your metrics manageable. So in terms of the top drivers for wellbeing strategies, it's to increase employee engagement, uh, improve the organizational culture, and also improve the employee value proposition. So they were the main three key drivers for wellbeing strategies. And that's kind of reflected in what people are starting to measure. But there's a lot of other things that you can measure. And I think as part of your wellbeing strategy, what does success look like for you? So it's coming out with how to drive the metrics you actually want and what's going to be meaningful. Um, and then you can evolve from there. So is it about cost savings? Is it about understanding your whole well-being spend and looking at is it getting used effectively? Um, or is it about ins savings on insurance? 
Um, engagement and communication, obviously a key one, so understanding actually how you can communicate the initiatives you're rolling out and if that has an impact, and is that impact different for different segments of your business. Usage versus implied cost, a lot of you will know that um, for some of these um, services that you're buying, it will be a fixed cost per employee, regardless of if that employee uses it or not. So have a look at, look at that against the actual usage. And is it getting the right kind of usage for the, you know, the, the actual cost for one individual using that um, service? But of course, it's not all about cost. We want to see some health changes. So what can we bring in in terms of health change effectiveness um, and how can we measure that? And today we've got a health kiosk on our stand. Um, so I'd encourage you to go and have a look at that. It gives really good rich data for employees in terms of BMI and body fat content um, and all things like that where you can take a snapshot. Productivity, another thing that obviously leads into ROI. Productivity could be measured in several different ways billing hours, units of production, or just doing some kind of staff survey. Um, and then obviously talent attraction and retention. We're getting much more feedback from clients at the moment that especially the graduate intake now are asking the questions, what are you going to be doing for my well-being and how are you going to support me? So it's becoming quite a key thing in terms of attracting staff. And as the demographic ages and it's harder to get those um, younger people in, this is going to become more key. So I just wanted to bring this to life a little bit with a few examples. It's not one size fits all, as I said, and it can be very different. But some of our clients say to me, I'd love to do data analytics, but I don't have any data. Well, actually, a lot of clients do have data. You just don't know what data you've got. So where's the place to start? You can just start by looking at your employee demographics and really understanding them. So the age, the gender, the different occupations, the different locations, the different ways that those employees might want to communicate. Um, and this is just a slide pulling together some examples of data that you might have. So length of service could feed in and make you understand different divisions and, and where you've got retention problems. Um, you can also combine this type of data with other well-being research, national statistics, um, with things that your advisor could give you um, to look at, actually, given my demographic, where should I be focusing and how should I be communicating? It's not evidence-based in the such that you definitely know this is what your employee base will react or the risk factors they're facing, but it gives you really good insight to start your journey. Another one, if you're looking at your different plans and you're putting a strategy in place, there's just a really good um, example of just trying to measure what you're looking to do, so your objectives. This one's around reducing stigma and, um, around mental health. Um, so looking at the outcomes, looking at what's happening, um, but also looking at the impact of those outcomes and actually understanding that if you put something in place, you may have a different effect to your thinking of to start with because you need to understand your baseline. So for some companies, when we start looking at absence stats, they, they don't have any mental health absences whatsoever, but they have very high gastrointestinal absences. So it's understanding actually what's driving that and the culture that's driving that. And then if you start reducing that stigma, you will probably see it go up to start with, um, and that's okay. And then finally, um, one of our clients who has had an established program in place for a very long time um, came to us wanting to develop a quarterly mon um, mental health dashboard. And in this, they pulled together all of the data that they have around mental health. So that's around insurance, it's around their demographics, it's around their absence statistics, um, CBT, on-site GP, health screening, Wherever they have data that could relate to mental health, we pull it together in one place. This is just a couple of example slides from there. The actual slides obviously have insight onto them. This is obviously dummy data. It's not their data at all. Otherwise, I'd be able to tell you what was going on. Um, but we look at here, for example, um, the key things for them to measure are what's my baseline? What does mental health look like in my company at the moment? And what's the cost of that mental health? And if you wanted to then add on presenteeism costs, you could, you could look at some of the research that's out there that gives you a proxy for that. So you could add that in here. But it's also looking at are the pathways that I've put in place working? So is my CBT working? Um, 
is my um, Oc Health working? Everything like that. So it pulls together the combined insight into this is our baseline, this is what's happening, this is how it's changing. If I put an initiative in place, what impact is that having and over what time period? Um, and that's just another slide from it. So looking at the salary costs. And here you'll see as well, we, we pull in mental health, but we also pull in minor illnesses because they kind of interact with one another in terms of your culture and what people are willing to say that they're off for. But this is just one example. You can also drill down into this dashboard so then you can start looking at different divisions and then you get better insight into actually are divisions treating every, everyone consistently or are there pockets? So just to, to summarise, it's just really key and it's boring, I know, but it's like when you do decorating, to get the best results, you have to fill in all the cracks and do all the prep work. Um, so there is preparation work that you need to do, but that's how you get the best results. So define your scope and purpose, plan a data strategy and be realistic. There's a cost to collecting data, um, and there's also, you know, you could put the, the data capture in place and people don't really want to fill it in. You have to work with people to get the data you want and understand their user journey if, if the employee, for example, is filling in their absences. Um, so that's where you need to do the benefit cost analysis. Um, supplement with external benchmarks. At the moment, there's a lot out there. There'll be a lot more coming um, as, as this place, this space evolves. Um, so there's a lot of good insight that you can use and you can combine it with your internal demographics to understand things more fully. Um, definitely discuss and agree data as a, as a really important factor when you're talking to suppliers. Um, and future proof when you can. But don't worry about starting. There's a lot of words out there, big data, AI, all of those things. For the majority of companies, that's, that's so far away. It's more about just getting your base right at the moment and starting on the journey. Okay. So, thank you. One. I think we might have time for one question. Sorry. I can move down here. Uh. So do you find in your clients more sustainable results from organisation interventions or individual interventions? Well, we're true believers that you can't impact an individual and really help behaviour change unless you get your culture right. So that it's a combination of both. Your strategy should reflect both improving that culture to get the most impact from the individual interventions you put in place. If your employees don't have trust in you, they're really not going to use them. Um, and also some things to consider, there's a lot of sort of technical apps out there that you can use, which are great, but they're only part of the story. They're just a tool. If you give someone an app, they could have just got an app off the website and done it themselves. They've chosen not to do that. So how do you help them and how do you make your culture one that, that creates that journey? Oh, one more. Uh, how, can you me oh. how can you measure process success as well as outcomes? I think this, yeah, it is a hard one because obviously if you're looking at two groups of individuals um, or if you're looking at one group of individual and you're putting things like early intervention in place with your income protection, for example, you can't tell actually would that person's journey be different because they've got that early intervention because you haven't got the, the base sample to look at. So it is difficult. I think the things that we concentrate on are around are people engaging with that initiative? Do they value that initiative? And overall, when you look at the averages of what's happening with your employee health, is it improving? So you might not be able to tell for an individual that their journey is, is better. You should, it should reflect that, but th that is quite difficult and you need to bring the wider data into it. Okay, thank you.